while it may appear that I choose these scriptures from 2 Samuel in order to make Sam uh, earn his seminary degree, I believe that there's value in continuing to read through 1 and 2 Samuel and understanding what God is teaching us as part of the bigger story. If you walk away with nothing else today, I pray that you will see how when we know more of Scripture, we are able to understand in a deeper way what God is speaking to us. This Scripture from 2 Samuel 21 introduces to us David. Now we know that David is already the king of Israel. David has already had mighty military successes. He's reclaimed the throne again. He has been one of the greatest leaders in Israel. But don't lose sight of the fact that the first line is the Philistines went to war again with Israel. I want you to consider in your own life those enemies, those struggles, those journeys that occur again and again and again. My understanding is that Pastor Franklin preached on breaking cycles in our lives last week. The ways in which we are given in the power of God the ability to break chains that at times have come from generations. But there are moments when there are struggles that return over and over. I want you to raise your hand if you've ever fought the same enemy more than once. And if in your faith journey, there is a place that for some reason, God keeps bringing you back to. If you are anything like me, you get a little bit frustrated with an enemy whose name you already know. You get a little bit frustrated that in this journey, you still seem to be facing the same giant. David and the people of Israel are fighting against the Philistines. And in the second verse, it says, they fought against the Philistines and David grew weary. Some scripture translated, translates it as exhausted. That point in the journey where you say, I'm done. I got nothing left. This is not just a, I had a hard day and I need a nap. This is not just, this is a difficult season. But this is an enemy that keeps returning. And David is an older man who does not have the same physical stamina that he did. Look at what God teaches us. And it goes through to talk about all of the qualities of these giants. Now, if you were a child with a Sunday school faith, what would you tell me about David? What's David famous for? For killing Goliath. What an awesome story. A young boy who picks up stones and throws them at this giant Goliath. He is part of what community? The Philistines. Once again, years later, we're fighting the Philistines and scripture is so intentional about talking about how big these Philistines are. In fact, I don't even know the theological significance. I should have dug into this. I don't know what it means that the dude has six fingers and six toes, right? And the Bible says 24 in total as if we couldn't add six plus six plus six plus six. This guy is so big and so weird, that he has 24 appendages. David is tired. He is exhausted. He's fighting giants that he has faced before. And what I want us to pay attention is when his people see his weariness, David's men swear to him, you shall not go out with us into battle any longer so that you do not quench the lamp of Israel. David was tired, and God wasn't done with his story, and God knew that he couldn't do it alone. And because God knew, he brought these men alongside David, who sent him home to rest. Now I want you to think about your own life. When you have faced a giant that returns again and again, raise your hand if you know somebody has sent you home to rest. 
They've said, go home. You are not helpful on this battlefield right now. You need to go home and rest. And David had this amazingly important journey or, or job. He's supposed to go back because what is he supposed to care for? What is he supposed to care for? He's supposed to go back so that he does not quench the lamp of Israel. The light that symbolizes the presence of God. Sometimes we weary ourselves fighting so hard when God is sending us home to take care of the light that he has given us. David's men fight. Are they victorious? They're victorious. They defeat these strange giants. And scripture tells us that they fell by the hands of David and his servants. Now, do you think David would have preferred to kill them himself? What do you think? Yes or no? I would think yes. A military commander, a man who was known from his beginning, having slain this giant Goliath, of course. This is what he's made for. This is what he does. So why would God require David to have victory through someone else? And why might God require you and I to learn to depend in a way that we don't really want to? There is something powerful about what God is doing with David. As I looked deeper into this topic of dependence, I came across the words of Charles Finley, an amazing evangelist. Uh, Some of you know him, a graduate of Oberlin College, and Finley was instrumental in the foundation of Oberlin. There in your sermon outline, there's a quote from Finley that speaks about just how hard it is for us to depend on God and let him use somebody else for the victory he's bringing us to. Again, as we do not see nor hear nor directly feel the hand that supports us, we are constantly prone to forget that we are supported. Raise your hand if you know at some phase in your life you have lost sight of the fact that God has held you. That where you are is not by your own strength, That what you have is not out of your own earnings. Finley says that when we don't see or hear or directly touch that hand of God, we we fool ourselves into believing that we're not supported. The influence that Christ exerts, he says, is not a physical influence. God will not stand at the threshold of your door and say to you, don't leave this place. Till you know who I am. But his is a moral influence. It's the power of truth and per- persuasion. The power of divine light that sustains the mind. And even when we don't see this agency of Christ sustaining us, we're very apt to overlook the fact that he is our constant support. I want you to consider that the times in your life That God has made you depend on someone else, on something else, on his strength alone. Are moments that God is bringing you to a deeper sense of his work in your life. Finley goes on to say, there's nothing more contrary to natural pride and independence of human nature. Dependence goes against what we want for ourselves. There is not a doctrine of the Bible which we are more prone to disbelieve and practically reject than this. It may be admitted as a theory forever without being believed. How many times do we say, arms open wide, I give you all. How many times do we kneel at the rail and say, I surrender all. How many times do we declare that we depend on God and yet we live our lives? 
in our own strength, in our own accomplishments, and in our own victory. Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Apart from me, what can we do? Nothing. We say it, but we do not live in this dependency that God asks. I think part of it is we don't know how. How do we teach ourselves to depend on God? How do we let go when everything in us, like King David, wants to be the one to slay the giants once again? How in the middle of the journey do we yield to him? I suggest to you that there are five things, and they may sound like they have nothing to do with dependence, But I submit to you that they are at the core of what Scripture teaches if we want to yield to him. The first, and it's on the back page of your sermon outline, is listening to God. If he's the vine and we are the branches and we can do nothing apart from him, we must listen daily. And I know I've talked a lot about this over the last couple of months. But I believe that sometimes now we're at the point where you just check it off. You either have done it and said, yes, Pastor Jen, I have my little time with God. Or you've decided you can't or you won't or it doesn't matter. And I'm here one more time to say it is at the core of learning to yield to him. Because he won't stand at your door and block you on the way out of the house. But if you yield to him in the morning, five minutes, ten minutes, and begin to attune your life to his, you will notice how deeply you need him. Honestly, honestly, an hour after I felt convicted to preach on this, I was standing at the corner of 355, watching a car run over our family dog. And there is nothing like watching a living thing lose its breath to remind us how much we need him. Did I know when I walked out that door what would happen? Of course I didn't. Did I know the night before that I should have kissed her to go to sleep in a different way? Of course I didn't. We are dependent every day on the breath that he gives us. And in order to depend on God, we have to listen, make the space to hear him. The second, and it's like our time, the first fruit of our time needs to be his. And the first fruit of our financial earnings needs to be his. Now hear me when I say I think this is part of depending. Tithing is a Jewish Christian understanding of giving the first 10% of your gross income to the church in which God has planted you. It is the first 10%. And it is given to the place where you are growing because it will require you to depend. And you may not have all that you want, but he will give all that you need. God has no need of our money. God needs our dependence on him. I'll tell you, and I've told this story before, Edgar and I made a decision to begin tithing when our lives were just beginning and everything seemed upside down. We had two small children and the amount of money that we spent on child care alone was overwhelming. And looking at the numbers, it made no sense. But instead of going to a financial planner, we went to pastors. Tell me how you got to the place of tithing. Tell me how to walk this journey. It took Edgar and I many years. In fact, it wasn't until we were here at Epworth that we finally were able to make the full tithe. But the process of continually reorienting your finances in a way that requires you to put him first 
is a humbling and transformative experience. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates and pour out so much blessing, there will not be enough room to store it. That's the thing about depending on God. It feels so counterintuitive. It feels like we need to be stronger. It feels like we need to hold on tighter. It feels like we need to control more clearly. And God says, yield it. Give it. Go home and guard the light. Let me fight the battle. The third place that I believe calls us to a deeper sense of dependence is to be a part of a church. I want you to raise your hand if every day that you wake up, you're happy to be a part of Epworth. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to confess to you, every day I wake up, I am not happy to be a part of Epworth. There are mornings when I wake up and I think, Lord, this is crazy. It is hard to be in relationship with people. And I would really rather some days walk this journey alone, so I think. And that's not what God calls for. God says, be a part of a body with all its craziness and need because probably part of that is yours. Be a part of a body and in growing with others, learn to yield. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you brothers and sisters by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you be in agreement that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Epworth is not at this place right now. We are not at this place. And in order to be at this place, we need to be all so deeply dependent on him that we are yielded to where he is leading. Dependence on God is formed by being a part of an imperfect body, the church. The fourth place that I believe we learn to depend is when we risk in love and relationship. Think about David when he isolated himself, when he sent the men off to war, when he was back alone. The temptations were greater. The sense of those who held him accountable was less. Being in relationship, allowing someone to pray for you, to ask how your soul is, to hold you accountable, is at times a difficult process, but God wants us to be in relationship. 1 Corinthians 12 is this beautiful scripture about the body. It says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. The process of being in relationship makes us dependent. The last thing I offer to you is if we really want to depend on God, to push against our human nature, to do it ourselves, to get the credit, to hold the control, the fifth thing is to persevere. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Turn to your neighbor and say, We walk by faith and not by sight. And what does that mean? It means when David is exhausted in the middle of the journey and does not know how he will stand, he trusts the men God puts before him. It means when the journey's not finished and you don't see the fruit that you want, you continue to walk step by step. It means when the Philistines come back again, after you've already defeated that enemy, you persevere because God is at work in ways you cannot see. Depending on God, is at the core of accepting the cross. And it is the hardest thing for us to yield. In closing, I have two things that I want you to do. First, I assume you received one of these when you walked in. 
You didn't get here alone. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody interceded for you. Somebody witnessed to you about who Christ was. Somebody sent you home to guard the light of the Lord while they fought the battle. Somebody has been by your side. Whomever that person is, I want you to write their name, not just my mother, but like your name, right? Not who they are to you, but their name on this card. Next Sunday, Marlo and Georgina and others are going to help us with a heavenly banquet table. They'll be all over the church. And in addition to being All Saints Day, where we honor those who have just died this year, we will honor the saints those who have journeyed with you, those who are part of that community of faith, those who taught you to depend when you didn't want to have to depend on their prayers, who has been influential in your journey. Write it on here. You can put it in the offering plate or give it to the ushers as you leave. Huh? You can write multiple names. You can have more than one. You can do whatever you need to do. These can be folks who are alive who are, or who are eternally living. But these are the names of those that have helped you in the struggle. Because even though you don't want to name them, you didn't get where you are alone. You didn't get where you are alone. Finally, I want you to pray about your financial promise to Epworth. And what this says about your willingness to depend on God and to trust God. You can put this in the offering plate today, or you can do it next week, or you can do it online per the instructions. Learning to depend is not just an idea. It is a process of allowing God to form us. Yes.